Good morning and welcome back to day one of Real Estate Live UK's October 2021 programme. Our weeks of free to attend virtual events run three times a year in February, June and October. The programme is brought to you by White Label, our partners and sponsors, and we'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the organisations that have contributed to the exceptional lineup taking place this week. During the sessions this week, places across the UK are showcasing investment opportunities and industry-leading experts from the public and private sectors will be discussing new ideas and topical issues relating to property. You can view the full programme of sessions taking place on our website, which is www.realestatelive.co.uk. Several of our panels and presentations are linked to our key themes for the week, culture and community, sustainable places and wellness. Right now, we head to Ealing for a session in partnership with Ealing Council as we look at their plan for good jobs. But just before we start, I'd like to remind you, the audience, to please feel free to ask questions using Zoom's Q&A function. And now I'm pleased to hand over to our chair for this session, Bill Bowler, Partnerships Director at West London Business. Over to you, Bill. Thank you, Callum. Welcome, everyone. As recovery from COVID-19 continues across the UK, Ealing Council has reset its economic growth priorities by placing local communities at the heart of its recovery. These priorities have now been published in its new Plan for Good Jobs, which sets out how, as partners, Ealing should come together, share knowledge, resources, and responsibilities in rebuilding and renewing Ealing's local economy. The document is the Council's action plan for mitigating the impacts of COVID-19 with a focus on creating good jobs, one of the Council's three new priorities. In this session, we'll explore how private and public partners and business can collaborate with Healing Council to increase and expand its access to good quality training, apprenticeships, and jobs to ensure the borough and its communities thrive. We are joined today by Councillor Peter Mason, leader of Ealing Council, Davinia Venton, Partnerships Director, Countryside Properties, Julian Shriven, Managing Director, Brompton Bikes, and Matt Snowden, Dean of Academic Partnerships UK and Director of Research and Enterprise Operations. We'll start today with a question for Councillor Mason. Councillor Mason, what are the factors that led to Ealing's plan for good jobs? And how can partners in particular, the real estate and regeneration sectors, help the council to meet its challenging objectives? Um, hi, Bill, and thank you everybody um, for today and also for joining those um, watching along. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here, but also to talk about probably what is the biggest challenge that we face as a council and, and as a borough. Uh, which is the prospect of um, certainly the end of furlough um, and the consequences of uh, COVID-19. Um, and, and the reason that Ealing has really refocused its sort of um, efforts onto the issue of growing good jobs is precisely the consequence from, of that. Um, as of four days ago, at least, we had the highest number of people on furlough um, and a significant number of people therefore now facing huge financial challenges. Um, but at the same time that we knew that we had people on furlough in the supply chain of for example, um, Heathrow, which won't see its return to sort of normal operations until 2023. We also have the second highest number of people on in-work in benefits and the second highest number of people um, unemployed. Uh, and that really tells you something about a, a borough that's made up of um, seven, eight, seven towns um, with, of course, OPDC on our doorstep that struggles, even in the context of a growing city like London, to be able to provide decent um, living incomes to a significant proportion of the population. Um, and even if you look on an uh, east-west uh, comparator, the place that I represent in South of Green, your average income will be about £18,000 compared to the average income of about £40,000 if you live in Chiswick. And really, I think what COVID has done is it's certainly made us think about what the future growth of a borough like Ealing is. Um, and I think it's really put a question mark over whether or not we can continue effectively as a dormitory town, sending sort of rich people to rich jobs in rich skyscrapers, uh, in the central activity zone, whilst poor people get on the 207 and the 94 to clean them, or if we need to carve out a new feature for ourselves as a borough, one that isn't so dependent on residential growth and development to fuel uh, our economic growth, but actually looks at some of the amazing businesses, the amazing industry, uh, and the amazing, amazing commercial activity that we have going on in our seven towns, uh, represented by um, some of the people speaking um, on this panel today. And so really what a good jobs um, program is all about is about refocusing on people. It's about refocusing on communities, but also looking at that through the prism of climate ch change 
uh, and climate action to see what we can do to sort of support the local economy to get back onto its feet, but also to provide uh, a new opportunity and a new vision for, for the borough as a whole. Sorry about that, thank you. Um, next question is for Matt Snowden. And Matt, as West London um, University is one of the leading higher education institutions in West London, what are you doing to ensure that the courses that are being offered are the ones where good local jobs are available for the people then to start their careers post-education? Uh, thanks, Bill, and uh, thank you for, for the opportunity to, to represent the university and talk about what we're doing. We're very proud to be based in Ealing. Um, we have a long history here. Um, and in terms of local jobs, I think the first thing I'd kind of like to highlight is we're very much a local university. We've always seen um, education and higher education as a means for um, social advancement, social uh, mobility, um, to support people to develop better lives. Um, and it's interesting, you know, 70% of our students are actually from London. So we're very much a local university. Um, I think the other aspect is uh, employability is really in our DNA. It's a core focus. Our Strapline is the career university. And that's there for a reason. We've always sought uh, to ensure that our students come out highly employable. Uh, and the, uh, the, the graduate employment stats have always supported us in that regard. Um, and we do that in a number of ways. We're very keen to make sure we engage with local businesses around um, the development of courses that meet their needs. So as a principal, we engage with uh, industry and we engage with practice when we're designing and creating new courses. And we want that perspective. We want that employer lens on what we're doing. And then throughout the experience, uh, the learning journey, we try and make sure that our students have lots of opportunities to develop real world skills. You know, whether that's placement, internship, um, whether it's around um, kind of opportunities to um, design assessment around real world challenges for business. You know, these are all the things that we really seek to do. Um, and then the final opportunity there is around bringing practitioners in, bringing local businesses in to talk about what the world of work is like, to, to really give life to the kind of the, the degrees and what they're covering. I think the third area I'd really like to highlight is around apprenticeship. Um, you know, apprenticeship is there to, to support the creation of really good jobs locally. Um, and you know, we're really proud that over the last few years, we've grown to just under a thousand apprentices, um, ranging at a whole range of different levels and a whole range of different sectors. Um, and for us as a university, that's a perfect match to our career focus. Um, you know, Apprenticeships are a wonderful opportunity, both for young people, but also for supporting businesses to develop their talent, to grow that internal expertise. Uh, another area I'd like to focus on is creative. Um, you know, Ealing is a real hub for the creative industry, um, and our history really aligns with that. You know, back to the you know, Ealing Photography School of the 60s, um, the work we do around film, you know, the creative side is really, really important to us. And that's one where it's absolutely about real jobs. Um, and often it's about developing those students to be able to have a career once they've graduated, which is around starting up their own business. It's around freelancing. So we're really keen to make sure that we're giving people those skills to be able to flourish after they graduate. Um, and one of the ways we do that is through supporting business startup. We have a uh, Westmont Enterprise Hub, which is our incubator. Um, and that's there not just to help students create new businesses and new jobs, but it's open for, for anybody. Uh, it's a facility for the community. Uh, and we see that as part of our role. You know, creating good jobs is also about creating new businesses that can grow and flourish uh, and employ people. I think the final thing I'd like to kind of focus on is around how we build back better in a more sustainable way. As a business, we're trying to role model that. We've just spent about five million pounds on a decarbonisation project across our campuses. Uh, and we're looking at how we can embed sustainability across our curriculum. So that the, you know, as the world changes, as things like environment become more important in the world of business, we need to make sure that's reflected in our courses. Matt, thank you very much. Sounds like University of West London is up to some exciting things in terms of you know, supporting healing and the good local jobs. Davinia, as let's hear from the private sector, as the 
countryside is a major investor across the UK. How are you working to ensure your developments in Ealing are places where people want to live and work as well? Thanks, Bill. Thank you for everyone joining today. Um, as I said, we are a national house builder, and we really focus on working in partnership with local authorities and housing associations to create the most and the best we can from all of our developments. Property development has a significant impact on local communities and rightly show they should benefit more than just lovely place making and beautiful buildings. They should have economic prosperity and social value from all of the developments. So what we like to do is really engage at the outset with communities and produce bespoke um, strategies for economic prosperity that is really tailored around the unique opportunity in areas. And normally we can do this in four stages in the design, planning, construction and the occupation of the buildings. So with Ealing Council, we are delivering the South Acton Estate um, and it's a JV with L&Q. Here we will be developing 3,500 new homes with ancillary retail and significant community uses. And what we've done here is really engage with the local community because it's such a long-term project. It's going to be over 15 years at this delivery. So it's really important we have those close relationships and we've produced a comprehensive bespoke strategy that gets reviewed annually. And that's really important, the annual review, because after COVID and we've seen how people's priorities have changed and obviously Ealing Council's um, objectives have changed as well. It's important that we can be quite flexible with what we're doing. So when it comes to jobs and skills, we really focus, we try and focus on different areas. So school, school leavers, graduates, apprenticeships and local labour. We find it's really important to engage with schools quite early so that students understand what career opportunities there are in the built environment sector. So an example of this is the construction event we're gonna be holding next month. And here we um, work with local colleges and schools to get as many students down as possible. So I think we're gonna have between 120 and 150 students on site in South Acton. And here we show them through our subcontractors and consultants, uh, um, architecture, engineering, and lots of the trades from bricklaying to, um, to being plumbers, dry liners, kind of all the major trades that are going to be uh, were used in the development. And we show them different stages of construction as well. And then after that, we um, set up networks between the students who came to site and the different subcontractors and consultants in the hope that they will potentially have work experience in these organisations or potentially some mentoring as well to really foster those early relationships. And then once um, the students have left school, we try we have a um, construction training program where they can become a site manager or quantity surveyor. And we pay for their courses and, um, with the objective of them actually starting in our organization once they're qualified. Um, and finally, we have the um, countryside graduate program. And hereby, we advertise locally on all of our different estates, and especially in South Acton, because it's such a flagship regeneration for us. And we try and encourage different residents in the local community to apply. Um, and then we work with them over a three year period to see which core area within development would be more suitable for them. These are kind of, that's our broad ranging strategy. And then we also have our section 106 commitments, which is our local labor and our apprenticeships, which is very important. And we like, we monitor these monthly to ensure we are maximizing as much as possible our relationships with the community to ensure that we are really fulfilling our obligations in these areas. So that's more from a job creation, but also we feel it's very important to social value, which can also lead to jobs. And it's the cultural element of that. So at South Acton, we have a community board, predominantly consisting of residents, and they um, work on our strategy annually to ensure that we are maximizing social value and also the LLP is held to account. And here we have a community chess that the LLP pays towards and different organizations within the community can apply for grant funding. And these can be anything from dance classes to sewing to really could be it for anything as long as it helps the community and a lot of it is culture-led as well especially after the pandemic a lot of that has been the focus and um, in addition to that we have a community and youth centre in South Acton which the LLP 
pays a dowry towards for a fixed term. And this is a local heart of the community, which is actually um, during the pandemic was really used for different organisations and for kids to get out of apartments and have somewhere safe and um, for communities to come together. So it's really looking at the strategic picture when you look at a development that's from the economic prosperity and the social value in order to be able to create social positive change in an area. But we work with all our partners in order to achieve this. So Ealing Council and LNQ are fundamental to setting that vision. And then it's really down to the LLP to deliver it. Many thanks. Apologies, I'll get the hang of this mute button stuff shortly. Thank you, Navinia. It's lovely to hear about the great experience that Countryside has and, and being able to bring it to Ealing to show how the real estate can help drive the economic development and creation of jobs. And our final speaker was Julian and from a local business which has built a, a brand name and has decided to remain and continue to invest in Ealing. How does Brompton Bike support the creation of local jobs and, and what role do you see businesses like yourselves um, playing in Ealing's future economy? Well, thank you for such a kind introduction, Bill. Really appreciate it. So I think Brompton's uh, been in uh, West London uh, since the early 80s. And uh, we've been in, a in Ealing now for, I think, the, the last uh, five years in particular. And, um, you know, much as the cycling industry has grown, over the last few years for all the reasons everyone known about. Brompton uh, Bicycles, the main brand, and Brompton Bike Hire, uh, the sub-brand, have both grown incredibly fast, especially over the last three years. So we've seen, uh, in terms of just big numbers for you, um, two years ago, we built 50,000 bikes, and we were quite pleased with ourselves. Last year, we built 70,000 bikes in the, in the grips of the COVID crisis with social distancing on the factory floor. And anyone else thinks it's bonkers to build London bicycles in the middle of London, you're probably right, it is, but it's what we do. Uh, this year, we're on track to build 100,000 bikes uh, in West London, uh, making us the biggest uh, manufacturer of, of bikes in the UK by, by some considerable margin. Now, that's come, um, of course, with a, a real demand and a need for, for, for good quality uh, people. Um, you know, uh, we are, I think, over 550 people. Uh, now, as I, as I sit here talking to you, and we've grown in terms of staffing 30% every year for the last three years. Uh, as I sit here, I think we've got 50 jobs unfilled at uh, at Brompton. And this is not just building bikes. Of course, 75% of our staff are working downstairs doing what I call the real work. Uh, but there's 25 of us that float, 25% of us that float around uh, in the office pretending, pretending to, to earn a living. Uh, while the other people do all the heavy lifting, as it were. Um, and in terms of supporting good jobs, I mean, we've kept um, our business in, in Ealing. Um, um, we want to continue to work within Ealing. We want to work across uh, the public and the private sector to try and encourage a lot more people to come in from the local area. I mean, one of the challenges we face today um, is the, the average distance travelled by our staff to come in as I said, we've gone up 30% year on year in terms of staffing. That's also the same percentage we're seeing on average journey taken. So we, we really want to reverse that as an, as an active travel company. Seeing people coming in from further and further away breaks our heart. Um, so we want to really kind of engage with, with Ealing Council and with actually with property developers. I mean, we're very lucky that we've got uh, Greenford Keys just up the road that was built by Graystar. Um, they very kindly uh, funded one of our docks so people can actually cycle to and from their lovely uh, places to their places of work. But counterwise, we want to work with them to encourage people who are moving in there to consider Brompton uh, as their home. Um, we know we want to try and uh, build that type of thing, but it is, I'm not going to lie, for us, it's a, it's a real struggle today to bring in the calibre of staff that we need. And to be clear, we have jobs where uh, your requirement is to walk through the front door right now. So our brazers, we will take them from someone who doesn't know one end of a, um, a brazing torch from the other and take them through a two-year in-house apprenticeship to someone who will then be a fully qualified brazer. We just can't get the people. And we, uh, uh, as I sit here, hearing about how we've got such a high number of people who are going to be coming out of furlough in the local area, we hear about the number of people who are struggling for jobs in the area. 
uh, we want to reach out and work much more closely with everyone else who's sitting at this thing today and say, well, yeah, we've got the jobs. <laughs> You've got the people. There must be a solution here somewhere. Thank you, Julian. That's a beautiful call for action. And, you know, if I think about, Councillor Mason, your, your strategy where you've got the FEs and uh, higher education like University of West London Engage, you've got the national investors who have selected Ealing, and you've got the local businesses who have something to gain. With all that in play, what do you think the priorities are for the next 18 months to really bring your plan into fruition? And I'd like to hear from everybody what they kind of think the, the next steps are given where we are. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? Um, the sort of the decoupling of um, the fact that we that there are jobs for those who don't have them. Look, uh, it's multi-layered. I think partly we are, uh, partly as a country, I think we focus an awful lot, quite rightly, on sort of post-16 education and pathways of young people into employment. Um, I think what the, pan what the pandemic has done, um, and certainly the fast-forwarding of the decline of the retail sector and the decline of other sectors, for example, um, is really challenged the notion that um, any individual can have um, a career in one particular industry or one particular job that they can stay with um, for a considerable period of time. Um, and so what you actually have now are people for whom perhaps have been doing one form of employment for a particular period of time and um, that now find themselves um, out, out of a job. I and mean, if you think about sort of heat rate supply chain, for example, uh, you know, as, as we say, that it won't get back up to full capacity until 2023. Um, that's air stewards, that's maintenance workers, that's baggage handlers, that's people working in retail in, um, in the various different terminals. Um, and those sort of working in the service sector or, um, or in um, technical jobs um, don't necessarily have somewhere immediately to go that, that sort of translates the skill sets that they, that they have. So as a local authority and working with local employers, we've got to be much more dexterous about ensuring that um, we can provide people with opportunity to reskill um, or to consider a completely alternative career. Likewise, employers have really got to think about the um, skill sets that they're asking for of local employees um, if they want to try and get people um, into the sort of um, areas and vacancies that they do have. And of course, you know, we wouldn't, um, we wouldn't, of course, uh, be, we wouldn't, of course, have a shortage of HDG drivers if we weren't to mention the big B word Brexit. Um, of course, that's had an implication on our labour supply too. So what we'll certainly be doing over the coming years um, is really deepening the relationship with local businesses to understand where those vacancies do arise and, and sort of skill sets that are required, but also working with all of our partners um, in business, but also in national government to start identifying where that transition can happen. Um, but then also working with the community, um, working with the community to sort of make sure that it's very clear that there are well um, paid jobs out there. They might be in completely different places that people were necessarily expecting them. You know, um, HGV, HGV drivers are now um, earning um, an inordinate salary, um, a salary that reflects the fact that there is such a huge shortage. Um, and of course, it takes time and skill, um, responsibility too, to, to sort of work in one of those jobs. So that's what the plan really is about. Um, it's about sort of deepening that relationship and reprioritizing and refocusing our energy to make sure that we have that relationship with all the people that we need um, on this call and, and hopefully watching too. I mean, one of the issues you raised that Julian raised is that there, there might be a um, mismatch sometimes between the skills and the talent we have and where the vacancies are. Um, Matt, have you seen anything on that from the HE perspective? Yeah, I think it's it's really interesting. One of the things that, you know, if, if there's a fair criticism of universities, it's that we've become very, very focused on uh, kind of undergraduate degrees, postgraduate degrees that are kind of full time um, and are a, a fairly long interaction uh, to build somebody's skills. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about the marketization of higher education um, and, and, you know, what we've seen over the last 15, 20 years is you know, the opportunities for part-time, shorter interactions to help build skills uh, on a slightly more modular level um, evaporated. Um, and it's very clear that that's something that needs to be rebuilt. It's something we're very conscious of at the university. Um, we are already planning forward for how we can take advantage of, for example, the discussions around freeing up the student loan to allow people to... Um, to build up to a degree over over their lifetime 
doing it in small chunks that would have a focus on a particular skill or a particular knowledge set. Um, you know, that's in a sense is going back to things we probably did 10, 15 years ago. Um, so there's an element of reinventing the wheel. Um, but I think this time around, it's been much clearer around how those uh, micro credentials, a horrible term, but that seems to be what, what people are saying, how those micro credentials actually map to, um, to the, the needs of business. You know, so whether we look at uh, existing frameworks or you know, the apprenticeship standards, for example, which give us really good clues as to the sorts of knowledge, skills and behaviours employers want, um, or whether we reach out to people like Julian and say, OK, what does this look like? If you want somebody to develop a higher skill in this area, what are the sorts of things you need? Um, we're very open to those conversations, but, you know, aware that this is this is a work in progress, um, you know, until they freed up that student loan actually the biggest barrier to this is funding you know people being able to access the funding to be able to access that education and training that gives them those skills okay okay thank you matt um we have a question that's come in that i'd like to put to uh davinia and councillor mason that i guess goes to the real estate aspect of driving economic development and the question is do there any problems reconciling the trend to convert urban area commercial industrial buildings to residential. So I guess I'll start with Nivenia talking about, could you talk a little bit about the role of, of residential and how you see that in terms of economic development in terms of that question? Um, I think that is definitely a challenge the industry faces at the moment. And obviously you have a lot of job losses through that conversion of industrial into residential. Um, and I think that's where sometimes you need a very strategic master plan from the outset to prioritise employment-led land in addition to um, more traditional residential-led development. So they can work alongside each other. And I think historically, a lot of land has been um, swept aside for residential development when actually there could have been a more strategic vision for the area where um, job, job um, and employment was definitely prioritised. Now, across a lot of our schemes, even if it's residential led, we do have um, job opportunities. So that could be in retail. It could be a GP, dentist. There's lots of different ways that we can have um, job creation within our developments. But yeah, a loss of brownfield land is really, really um, tragic for London because we still need that to support all of the industries that take place in London. Um, but I think it needs to be both public and private sector led to ensure that the land is um, in the longer term maintained as, um, as Brownfield in addition to the new residential that's happening. But that really needs to be alongside the council to prioritize that. Yeah, one of the, I mean, it's one of the existential sort of challenges of, um, of ensuring that we've got um, sort of half decent growth in the borough. I mean, under the old version of the London plan, um, Ealing sort of had um, uh, a requirement for net loss of strategic industrial land, um, which I always thought was sort of quite bizarre, and particularly when you compare it with the new London plan that, that tells us that we need to secure net gain. Um, and, you know, you might sort of think about what the motivations for um, each of those plans were, um, probably the form of um, a bit of speculation um, land speculation if you ask me but um we are where we are um look, I, I, we have to have land for employment um and if you look at our interaction for example with old oak park Royal development corporation you know one of the red lines of the principles that we we set out when we got involved with opdc was that we could see no significant loss um of employment space uh, and the preservation of old oak um park royal in terms of the industrial estate now we're obviously going to have to have some interesting conversations around the release of strategic industrial land for growth as a consequence of, the, um, of their inspection of the local plan, uh, but that's managed. Um, I think what we really need to hold our nerve on and probably what we will start holding our nerve on quite quite firmly um, is sort of speculative um, land acquisition and release. That being said, there are some interesting things that can be done and we're already starting to see come forward in the market. So, you know, um, and the, local, the London plan equally does encourage, uh, I think we would encourage the idea of mixed use um, development, where you can get sort of light industrial um, employment uses uh, coexisting with re residential. And obviously, that's a challenge, both in terms of investment cycles, but also um, offsetting the um, risks both for residents, but also for businesses in terms of the um, the noise and um, pollutants that they might um, might require to sort of deliver their business. 
Um, but nevertheless, there are ways of doing it. Um, and I think we need people to come forward with sort of innovative solutions as we've seen in, in different parts of the borough. Because um, ultimately, you know, say I, I, I pivot back, you know, we, we have to be able to find ways of ensuring that we can have residential and employment growth. Because um, otherwise, Ealing will just end up being um, sort of a sleepy dormitory suburb of uh, West London. Um, and when you consider that that's almost 100,000 people getting on trains, going to different parts of uh, London, um, not only is it sort of a, a drag on people's mental health and um, uh, and their ability to sort of enjoy their local communities, but it just isn't sort of fair or sustainable either. So, um, yeah, we, we, we are watching it very closely um, and discouraging it while we can. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Um, I wanted to raise another area that um, Matt briefly touched on, and it's an important part of the Good Jobs for Healing plan, which is the role of sustainability in terms of growing back. Um, would you, our panelists mind referencing how they see that factoring into their growth strategies? And Julian, we'll start with you. You can imagine that's a bit of a softball question for me. Um, <laughs> I mean, I try to stay away from the American, uh, you know, euphemism. So, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Funnily enough, um, we only actually brought in a sustainability manager ourselves um, 18 months ago. Um, You know, we we have been, while we're a sustainable transport company, perhaps we've been a manufacturer first for a long time. My role, ironically, is all about sustainability. Um, But I think it's very important to start baking these into the future of jobs. I mean, the green economy. Um, I mean, if you look at the pledges made by the Conservative government, okay, if you were at the fortunate enough to be at the Labour Party conference, as I was last week, um, a, a bit more ambitious, shall we say. Uh, and I think uh, businesses need to understand that this is the direction of travel for the country. Um, and as such, that that will bring opportunities and that they need to be positioning their businesses such that they can take advantage of it. I mean, I, I would not exaggerate to say... Um, 75% of, of my business, which is working on the on the hire and the um, automated systems for people to use our bikes, comes now with profit developers who are recognising the need to provide um, zero carbon, first mile, last mile travel at their site. Um, but similarly, um, we see local authorities also starting to pick up on it. So I think the green economy it has the opportunity to be a massive driver for businesses. And I think Ealing actually is a, um, a local authority that I've worked with in the past that certainly understands that and has understood it. But crucially, things like the um, West London business groups as well have a very high focus on it. So I think it's definitely, um, it should be seen as an opportunity, not a threat for businesses as we, in West London, in my opinion. It's great to hear. I mean, at the moment, if you saw yesterday's paper, it's not a great time in the U.S. where you don't see business stepping up to back government and what it's trying to sort of do. So that's lovely to hear. Um, Devinia, do you want to talk a little bit about how Countryside sees the relationship between sustainability and the creation of jobs? I think it's really fundamental. So as you've probably seen in the press recently, that we have um, a significant shortage of many of our trades at the moment, and that's predominantly to do with Brexit. So there's a huge demand on on our sites and within our organisation for jobs at the moment. And these jobs are changing over time, as you would expect, and they are having a a significant greener focus towards them. And so we need to, um, we've got a very strong sustainability strategy now in terms of how we're going to get to net carbon zero. And alongside that, we have a training scheme that we're going to be looking at how we can reskill people so that we actually have the people that we need to develop our growth plan and our vision within countryside. Because if you, you can't really ignore the fact that also people aren't skilled in the areas that we will need them to be skilled in. So it's about working um, with communities, but it's also about working actually with other developers so that we work together. So it's not everybody in isolation producing reskilling green programs. It's more that what's the best way of doing it as an industry and then working with those bodies to achieve it in the shortest time period possible. Because everyone's looking at this at the moment and it's a priority across all the London boroughs. And actually working together is the only way we're going to be able to do it in a comprehensive way. Thank you. Matt, do you want to talk a little bit more about what the University of West London does and sees in that? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as a as a major employer within Ealing, we do see that we have a role around sustainability and a, a role in terms of our impact on um, on the environment. So, you know, we've done lots of things over the years. We've you know digitised and massively reduced the amount of paper. Um, you know, universities are, are great at producing huge long handbooks. All of that's moved online. Massive reduction in the amount of paper we've used. All of our fleet has been moved to electric. Um, and as I said, over the summer, we've spent £5 million on a decarbonisation project, which has uh, you know, radically changed the way that we're going to heat the uh, all of our buildings um, in the coming future by sinking some quite large holes into the ground and tapping into the kind of the, the natural heat there. So, yeah, absolutely, as a business, we feel we should role model that. Um, in terms of uh, sustainability in the curriculum, I've mentioned that they are something we're really keen to do. Uh, and kind of interestingly mirroring Davina's comments, there's been a lot of conversations over the last three, four months between uh, ourselves, you know, the other universities in West London, um, but also the the FE colleges around the green agenda. You know, what are green skills? You know, how do they feed in? Um, what can we do to support clean tech startups? You know, there's a, there's a conversation there to be had uh, from an education side, um, which we're absolutely you know, very happy to be part of. Councillor Mason, do you want to expand a little bit more on the council's vision in terms of the green recovery for the jobs? Yeah, I mean, there is a world of opportunity out there to help us sort of transition to a green economy, um, not le not the least in uh, the production of clean energy and decentralised uh, energy and heat networks. Um, the fact that we've got a complete transition that's sort of on our, um, that's almost there, I mean, it's still sort of fairly expensive, but sort of the transition towards um, electric fleets, not just for business um, use, but for also sort of um, residential and individual use, it's, it's almost at our fingertips. And that means that there's going to need to be a significant number of people working um, in those industries. Uh, you know, the mechanics of uh, the mechanics of the combustion engine now needing to transition to understanding how to to, to, um, to hardwire batteries, to, uh, um, to axles and whatnot. But we've also got, of course, um, a, a, an amazing opportunity, and particularly in a built-up environment like West London, um, to actually see the um, uh, to see us get back to some a bit of a bit more biodiversity, um, rewilding and regreening. Um, and if you consider the sort of the significant number of players who who have land holdings and do seek to regenerate, you know, if we're if we're basically creating new parklands, if we're creating new green spaces, and we're creating more biodiverse locations, then of course that all needs to be maintained and that needs to be managed. Um, and there are opportunities there too. Um, but more fundamentally, it is about ensuring that we can sort of hit our zero carbon target um, across the, the, the entire borough um, and making sure everybody sort of plays their part in doing that um, and the opportunities that will sort of derive from um, from those jobs. You know, we do have to start where we do need to consider some, some bigger, broader issues. Like, for example, you know, the Architects Journal have been running their campaign for quite some time on um, uh, removing um, VAT from the reuse um, and restoration of buildings. At the moment, it's 20% for um, reuse and restoration where it's um, 0% if you build it new, so that you can really start to think about how we repurpose and reuse the existing built environment infrastructure that we've got, um, retrofitting and augmenting if, if we have to. Uh, and again, um, that will require an, an incredible amount of new and interesting skills that um, you know your, your traditional bricklayers and um, uh, your traditional bricklayers and groundwork people might not necessarily and have at the moment, but um, these are all great opportunities. And I think the more people that are focused on um, achieving them and um, thinking about them in a bit more depth, I think the, the better that we will be from it. Um, but there's a world of opportunity out there. That's great. Um, another area that's an important part of the plan talks about the cultural recovery and the role of creative industries. And as a young lad in the states the first time i ever heard of ealing was the phrase ealing comedy but of course i put two e's in there and had a whole different image but um but given that state history do you is there a role for the creative industries as ealing moves forward to look at good jobs and uh maybe let you take a break and maybe let matt start with this one and then we'll go around 
Um, from a university's perspective, absolutely. Um, you know, we we have a strong history in the creative sector, um, whether that's through photography, film, graphic design. You know, that's a really important part of what we do. But actually broadening that out into kind of more cultural areas, we have London College of Music. Um, so we produce, uh, you know, lots of interesting plays during the year. Uh, obviously, pre-COVID, COVID kind of put a bit of a a kibosh on uh, performance um, but actually giving people performance skills uh, absolutely vital to us and, and we think a really opportunity to to participate in the cultural life of Ealing. Um, you may or may not know that Drama Studio London which is also an Ealing based um, uh, education provider is part of the University of West London group so again supporting actors uh, to develop their careers yeah absolutely firm from a university's perspective creativity is is key. Thank you. Davinia, do you see providing cultural spaces and places of creativity as important to the kind of work the countryside is doing? Oh, definitely. I feel like, um, especially during the pandemic, the cultural um, industry has just suffered so significantly. And it's all of our responsibility to really work with different organisations to promote that. So within South Acton Estate, we have a very, very diverse population and it's about how we can really captivate that to provide um, as much value as possible from a developer perspective and to fund different initiatives that can really help prosper the cultural. Um, so lots of that is definitely working with schools and colleges and our community centre to see what we can fund and how we can get them involved in the design and also the occupation having different events we can put on within the centre so that um, we can help it flourish. But we do this across all of our developments and it's a large part of our focus to ensure that, um, yeah, the cultural side thrives as well as the the, the residential development side. And, and Julian, is, is culture part of what makes Ealing work for Brompton Bikes or is it kind of a nice to have? What, what is it, how does it factor into what you see? Well, I mean, it's quite easy to to overlook that we have a marketing team of probably about 40 people here now. And a large proportion of them are the, are the creative marketers who are working on a lot of our um, imagination behind uh, the marketing campaign and the marketing strategy. And yes, you know, it is, it is part of the weft of, of Brompton. I mean, Brompton has always been slightly... Slightly to, the, slightly to the side when it comes to creativity. I mean, it, it doesn't look like a regular bike last time I checked. Um, and we do um, actually enjoy and celebrate uh, the team and their, and their creativity. So yeah, in terms of, it, from a purist point of view, probably not that relevant, but in terms of culturally for, for Brompton, it, it's part of what makes uh, a West London bike company a West London bike company. And, and Councillor Mason, you've got the investment that you've been doing in Ealing Broadway to make it a cultural place. You've got the history. Um, I've heard about the TV and film industry. There were articles in the paper this weekend. Can you talk a little bit about the creative sector and what it means to Ealing's growth? Yeah, I mean, um, I think this is one's a fascinating discussion because sort of every now and again, um, you know, something comes along that for some might sort of feel a bit gimmicky that sort of then becomes the bedrock of sort of, you know, an interventionist um, economic growth strategy, right? And, you know, we've seen sort of in parts of East London them building great big film studios, but unfortunately not being supported at all um, with the supply chain. Whereas in Ealing, um, we are the home of creative industry within West London. It's not a gimmick, it's a reality. It's a reality that was born right at the turn of the century and continues to this day. Uh, you know, the fact that we had the BBC television studios on our doorstep um, until very recently, um, the fact that we've got a significant number of studios that exist within the borough already, the fact that we have so much production taking place in the borough, the fact that we have so much post-production as well taking uh, place in the borough, but also on our doorstep and in the west end of the um, the west end of the city, you know, the, the, the 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 fact of the matter is that the creative industry is alive and well in the borough of Ealing, whether that's film, television, uh, music, and much much more, um, and we um, perhaps more often than not sort of undersell it right and um, don't put it in the spotlight that it deserves uh, so I absolutely think we, you know we've got the um, you know we have got all the things that we need not just in the studio space that already exists but as I say in that sort of supply chain um, the uh, the creatives and the makers in different parts of um, our industrial estates all across the borough all working to produce incredible incredible stuff 
And, and we know that it's a great industry, partly because we keep on getting um, sort of creative industry people coming to us and saying, well, you know, we need big bits of land in which we can put studios in. Uh, and um, we've got an example in Southall um, where we've got um, Gall- um, uh, Galliard, Galliard Homes that have brought forward the, the old home on the factory, um, who have created both new residential uh, communities, but also at the same time providing three sort of huge studios. And equally, I'd say is, you know, um, our creative industry isn't just confined to central Ealing or to um, uh, or to North Acton too. We've actually got some incredible cultural activity happening in Southall, um, incredible grassroots community um, cultural activity that at the moment doesn't have a space in which it can necessarily come together and celebrate in the way that it did um, before with the sort of the seven cinemas of Southall. Uh, and we're looking at opportunities to sort of find ways of bringing cultural and performing arts and uh, uh, venues back to places like Southall and to Central Reading. But, you know, those skills and those opportunities exist and we want to try and find ways of really maximising them. Thank you. I mean, we, we, we've covered a lot of topics today. We've talked about, obviously, the creative sector, the role of sustainability, the role of real estate, the role of business. Um, another area I want to sort of bring up is diversity and inclusion. Um, Ealing is such a diverse place and we're hearing different things about where the opportunities are and how do we as a society make sure that we reflect the best of what lives in our communities. How is that part of what people are doing to ensure that Ealing grows and becomes the place that we all want it to be? Um, Davinia, I'll start with you. This is really fundamental and it's something that I think historically um, developers have probably struggled with, I would say, to try and get Um, a diverse workforce. But what we've really done recently, especially in Ealing, we've been working with women in construction and black people in construction as well. And we've invited them to our sites and said, okay, how, what is the best way that we can foster relationships within the local community so that we can have a really diverse workforce, both on site and employed with the countryside. Um, So we can maximize that. And I think it's this is fundamental that we do this um, because I think historically um, developers just haven't done enough, if we're honest. But this is something that's now a priority across the industry and especially for countryside. Um, and I wouldn't say we've necessarily um, we're there yet, but we're on a journey to achieving it. And we see it as a massive priority. Okay. Yeah. And as I said at the start, the university has also always seen education as a, a means of social mobility and enhancing people's lives. Um, we've always had a very strong focus on how we can support all of the community. Um, not that we can ever rest on our laurels, but our, our stats around widening participation have, have always been very good. Um, there's always more we can do. And I think looking at ourselves as a business, um, again, we might not be... Um, where we want to be, we certainly, um, in terms of diversity of our workforce, you know, we recognise that there's still quite a lot to go. Um, you know, if you look at you know, as an industry, the number of female black professors you can count in the country, you can count on one hand. Um, so, as an industry, we're very, very aware that there's a hell of a lot more we need to do. Um, but we're, you know, we're, we're certainly moving in the right direction, uh, looking at the ways that we promote, looking at the way we structure our roles to make sure that there's no kind of structural inequalities built into you know, the very nature of academia. Um, but as I think as Davinia said, it's, you know, it's a work in progress. But I think the focus and knowing that we need to work on that is part of the battle. Thank you. Julian. Well, if I start off by saying that with no sense of irony, I'm often asked to speak about diversity in cycling uh, or give you an idea of the endemic problem in cycling in terms of equality. Um, it's not often a white middle-aged middle-class guy is asked to talk about diversity, but apparently that is normal in cycling. Uh, I'm very happy to say that we really tackle this at the grassroots uh, at Brompton Bike Car and at Brompton. So my team has a, a great profile. Um, pretty much male-female 50-50 split, which when you think about 80% of cyclists are men is a good start. Uh, Again, ethnic diversity absolutely bang on. Um, Brompton has a really kind of front-footed approach to this as well. Um, But we're also tackling it in cycling itself. So, I mean, a lot of the initiatives we do now, we're running one in Merton at the moment, another one 
um, up in, in Birmingham, where we're actively providing free bikes to local pension cycle groups, which happen to be female groups, uh, BAME groups, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, if I look at my higher members now, 50% male, female split roughly, I think it's 48% female at the moment and a good profile. So, but it doesn't, it doesn't come by accident. And whether we're talking about recruitment, whether we're looking at anything, you've got to have a proactive policy. And I think, again, if we want to get the best people, we've got to make sure that the best people feel welcome to work at our place and don't self-select out. And I think if you go to look at people in our section in particular, you'll see a very low uh, or a very bad skew because people self-select out because they assume cycling is not for them. And so we've got to start right at the very bottom. And it starts in my marketing campaigns. If you go and have a look at pictures of people on Brompton bicycles in bike hire, it's not 20-something-year-old 20 blonde blokes on bikes. You know, it's more people like me and people not like me, even more importantly. Um, and that seems to have an impact because then it changes your customers and it starts to change your employees as well. So that's how we're kind of dealing with it. Thank you. It's great to hear such honesty from that. Councillor Mason, how do you take in this all in terms of how you see the, the vision moving forward to yeah. for healing to grow as it represents its, its talent there? Yeah, and, 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 and Bill, you said a really important point, a uh, really important word here, which is honesty. Um, and I, I don't think you can really get to the bottom of this issue unless you are honest about the state of play um, and about sort of the barriers that do exist. The unemployment rate in West London is 10% higher among Black, Asian and other minority ethnic communities. Um, uh, if you are Black in the London Borough of Ealing, you represent about 10% of the overall population, um, yet you're about 20 Three percent of people who live on um, council estates, and you're 29 percent of the, um, the, uh, the population who are on housing waiting lists. And um, all of that caused, of course, because of low incomes and the inability of people to be able to access um, genuinely affordable homes and decent living incomes that, that support that. Um, and you know, to sort of compound an issue, um, it's absolutely the case that if you are a young black man, you are far more likely to be excluded from school than any other um, than any other um, um, demographic part of our um, um, of our uh, of our pupils. Now that sort of tells you something about structural inequality, but it also probably tells you something a little bit more about structural racism that we really have to work very very hard um, to overcome in a place like Ealing, despite the fact that as a borough we are incredibly diverse, probably one of the most diverse places in the country. Um, and until you're sort of honest about the challenges and the barriers that exist for people to access decent education and decent employment, um, we're never going to start to overcome it. So it is really, from our perspective, about focusing very intensively on those parts of the community that don't get the opportunity um, that they deserve, about making sure that we work intensely within our education settings and also in our um, uh, with sort of higher and further education partners to make sure that those sort of pathways are open. But equally, working with people for whom haven't been in employment for a considerable period of time, because they haven't wanted to, but because disability um, has prevented them from doing so, um, and employers haven't felt comfortable or able uh, to provide the type of support um, within the workplace that means that people can sort of access the incomes that um, that, that they rightly deserve. Um, so it's going to be a it's going to be an effort, right? It's going to be an effort that's going to require every part of the um, work community, and every part of the skills community and every part of the wider community to be able to sort of overcome these barriers. But we, we can't start to do that unless we're really clear and honest about the barriers that, that do exist. Thank you, Councillor. And, and, and again, I think the beauty of what's happening in Ealing it, it is based on all this growth and all this willingness to be honest and work together to address the problems. And I, I think I agree whether it is diversity or sustainability or just job creation, that sort of being able to be honest with your partners and work collaboratively is going to be key to the future. Um, it appears we are coming up on the witching hour. And so what I wanted to do is give each of our panelists a chance for a, a final comment in terms of Ealing's plan for good jobs and the roles of your particular institutions. But I think also try and speak to the collaboration that would be necessary between all the sectors represented here. And, uh, We'll start with Countryside and Divinia. Thank you, Bill, and thank you for chairing so well as well. It's been a really interesting conversation. 
I think um, there's more that we can do within the Ealing to really engage with the local communities to ensure we're maximizing job opportunities. And this is from a BAME perspective, but also from cultural as well. And I think it's about having really honest conversations to say, this is what we're currently doing. And we are doing a lot at the moment in Ealing, but to see how we can maximize it, especially as a result of the pandemic and there's being people coming out of furlough and they need to be either reskilled or they need new opportunities. And at the moment, um, we are operating in three sites, three phases across the South Acton estate, and we're employing circa 400 people across the estate. So that's a huge number of people at any one point in time that we are employing through subcontractors and directly employing. So we just need to have more open conversations with the local networks to see how we can encourage more people from Ealing to be employed within there. Thank you. Thank you. Julian? Yeah, so I kind of uh, mirror Davinia's comments to a very large extent. I mean, I think I, I started out the conversation by saying um, we've got the jobs. Uh, Ealing Borough would appear to have uh, an issue with unemployment. We have a wide variety of jobs from, from um, professional white collar working in finance, in marketing, in operations. But we've also got starter jobs where, as I say, all we need is um, a, will a willing person to come and join us. and. Uh, want to have a, a, a bit of a, a different lifestyle a different way of working because Brompton is quite different uh, to work for but mainly in a good way I have to say um, but also it's just a and it's a word I seem to be using almost every day now which is to get rid of this whole concept of tribalism I mean uh, we hear about people talking about drivers and cyclists nobody talks about buses and trams. I mean we all share the same road space but it's the same when we talk about working do you know what it, it doesn't matter whether you're, I mean, some of our best um, brazers are, are the women because they actually really crack on. And there's this preconception that you somehow have to, you know, have to be a bloke and covered in hair uh, to build a bike. And you absolutely don't. We want anyone who wants to come and work with us to come and work with us. And the, the sooner we lose this tribalistic nature, whether it's talking about using the roads or working in our factory, the better we'll be. Thank you. Thank you. Matt. Yeah, I think my, my final comment is around kind of the nature of, of what is a good job. And, and as an educational institution, we'd probably always say a good job is one that allows an opportunity for the individual to, to grow and develop in that role. Um, and so I think it's the conversation and the, and the discussions around how collectively we can ensure that jobs do that, um, whether that's, you know, structured through things like apprenticeships and you know, whether it's giving staff opportunities to, to mentor uh, and support and engage in the, the local community to volunteer. I think there's a big conversation to be had there around um, how businesses, how employ um, employers, how education establishments can all be part of that community discussion about building opportunities to grow and develop uh, and seek better opportunities for the future. Thank you. For final words, Councillor Mason. Yeah, sort of, you know, reflecting on the conversation that we've had, you know, whilst the last 18 months has been incredibly difficult um, for all of us, not just sort of in workplaces, but also sort of personally. Um, and if we consider the challenges that we've faced as a consequence of COVID, but not just COVID in terms of the consequence of Brexit, the consequence of sort of rising prices, the, um, the challenges that we certainly face in terms of increasing demand on things like adult social care and children's social care, um, despite all those challenges we we have in front of us probably the biggest one but one that's completely achievable um, which is ensuring that we can connect people um, who need decent living incomes to the good jobs that they need to support them and there's a world of opportunity that exists out there in west london uh, and that's what our refocus is about our refocus is about ensuring that the jobs that we bring forward um, are able to produce the degrees of income that people need to support themselves but that we have that we're really clear that we can build that economy in a sustainable way, one that ensures that we secure good green jobs, that we are working towards our zero net carbon uh, target, that we're transitioning into the green jobs for the future, but that we put the community at the heart of that, and that we ensure that we're strengthening the identity of the seven towns that make up this borough, uh, and ensuring that the plan that we have for growth uh, is one that supports people to sort of live the lifestyles that they've perhaps gotten um, accustomed to working and. Um, enjoying their local communities more than they ever have before. 
Um, but that is a team effort. It's a Ealing effort. It's not just the council. Um, it's also the public sector and very, very important in the private sector that are going to help us do that. Um, and whether that's ensuring that you get to fill jobs that um, are currently unfilled um, in Brompton. Um, maybe I know what my uh, life after politics might be. Um, I think I quite, I quite like the sound of um, uh, brazing uh, bikes. That's, uh, that's a, an interesting one. Um, but Julian, I think we're coming at some point, aren't we? You're gonna, you're gonna have to, um, you're gonna have to have, uh, let me have a go. Um, I think that's the key. Um, but yeah, just to say thank you to everybody who's been on this call and everybody who's listening. And if this sponsors you to think of an idea or a way of um, ensuring that we are, are making those jobs inclusive, then um, um, give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much, Councillor Mason. I want to thank everyone for joining us. My apologies. Uh, it appears our last discussion on diversity inclusion did drop some questions, but we are out of time. I want to thank Davinia, Matt, Julian, and Councillor Mason. Thank you for joining us, and we turn it back over to Callum. Thanks very much, Bill, uh, and also to our panel uh, as well for a great discussion this morning, uh, and also to our session partners uh, this morning, Ealing Council. There's still more to come from Real Estate Life UK today. Uh, in an hour's time, our first lunchtime talk of the week with Chris Grigg, who is chair of the UK Infrastructure Bank, takes place. And then at 2pm, we'll be hosting a session in partnership with Develop Croydon, where we'll ask, how can Croydon ensure its regeneration is inclusive? Uh, you can book into these sessions uh, by visiting the program page on our website, www.realestatelife.co.uk. Just before we wrap up the first morning of October 2021's Real Estate Live UK, we have a presentation from our wellbeing partner, Therma Group, to encourage you to take a short break, ensuring you remain focused for the rest of the day. Supporting people's wellbeing is at the heart of everything Therma Group do, and they believe wellbeing goes beyond individual pursuits and is linked to each other and the natural world. Thank you all once again for joining us this morning. And we look forward to seeing you again. Go Ealing. Hi, I'm Cosmin, wellness manager at Terme Bucharest, one of Europe's largest well-being facilities. Supporting people's well-being is at the heart of everything we do at Terme Group. And that's why we're very proud to be the well-being partner of Real Estate Life 2021. We wanted to give you a small reminder about the importance of taking regular breaks from your screen for your mental and physical health. Researchers found that if you take breaks after one hour and a half or one hour for 10-15 minutes, it helps improve your mood, your concentration, your focus, and also protects your muscle and your joints. So don't forget to take a break from your desk after this session. Stretching, going outside, or making a cup of tea will gonna help you improve your physical well-being. I hope you enjoyed the incredible session at Real Estate Life 2021 and that one day we're going to have the chance to meet in person here in Terme Bucharest. Take care and enjoy.